Uchenna was a man known far and wide in Enugu. His wealth was like the rising sun, visible to everyone, and his influence was unmatched. He was the owner of several businesses, and his name was whispered in both fear and admiration in every corner of the state. His mansion stood like a fortress on the hill, and his fleet of cars was the envy of many. But Uchenna was not only known for his riches, his arrogance was just as legendary. When his wife, Chidima, finally gave birth to their first child after five years of marriage, everyone expected Uchenna to be overjoyed. The entire village had been waiting for this day, as Uchenna had always spoken proudly of how his son would inherit his empire. But when the news came that Chidima had given birth through a caesarean section, Uchenna's reaction was not what anyone expected. Lazy woman, Uchenna spat when he heard the news. How can she not push out a baby? What kind of weak wife have I married? The doctors explained to him that the surgery was necessary, that Chidima's life and the life of the baby were at risk if they had tried a natural birth. But Uchenna was unmoved. To him, childbirth was a test of a woman's strength, and in his eyes, Chidima had failed. He refused to visit her in the hospital. He did not call to check on her or the baby. Instead, he sent his driver to pick up his son and bring him back to the mansion. Chidima was left alone in the hospital, heartbroken and in pain, both from the surgery and from her husband's coldness. Uchenna had already made up his mind. If Chidima was too weak to take care of her own child, he would find someone else who could. And he knew just the person, Amoka, his beautiful young side chick, who had been with him for over a year. Amoka was everything Chidima was not, young, vibrant, and, most importantly, obedient. Without a second thought, Uchenna called Amoka and told her to move into the mansion. She was to take care of his son, to be the mother that Chidima could not be. Amoka was thrilled. She saw this as her opportunity to solidify her place in Uchenna's life and perhaps even replace Chidima permanently. Chidima returned home from the hospital to find her bags packed and waiting for her at the gate. Uchenna did not even have the decency to face her himself. Instead, he sent one of his servants to deliver the message. Madam, Oga said you should go to your parents' house, the servant said, avoiding her eyes. He said you are not needed here. Chidima could not believe what she was hearing. She had just gone through the most traumatic experience of her life, and now she was being sent away from her home, from her child. She tried to reason with the servant, but it was clear that the decision had been made. With tears streaming down her face, Chidima left the mansion and returned to her parents' house in the village. Her parents were shocked and outraged when they heard what had happened, but they could do nothing. Uchenna was too powerful, too influential. All they could do was comfort their daughter and try to help her heal. Meanwhile, Amoka settled into her new role as the lady of the house. She reveled in the luxury and attention, parading around the mansion as though she owned it. She posted pictures of herself with Uchenna's son on social media, bragging about her new life. To the outside world, it seemed as though she had won, but inside the mansion, things were not as perfect as they appeared. From the moment Amoka moved in, strange things began to happen. At first, it was little things, a door that would not stay shut, a light that flickered even though it had just been replaced. But soon, the disturbances became more serious. Amoka would wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of a baby crying, only to find Uchenna's son fast asleep in his crib. The cries seemed to come from the walls themselves, echoing through the halls of the mansion. No matter how much she searched, she could never find the source. Then there were the whispers. At first, they were so faint that Amoka thought she was imagining them. But as the days passed, the whispers grew louder, more insistent. They called her name over and over, until she could no longer ignore them. Amoka tried to tell Uchenna about the strange occurrences, but he dismissed her concerns. You're just imagining things, he said, waving her off. 
This house is old, that's all. There's nothing to worry about. But Amoka could not shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The mansion, once a symbol of wealth and power, now felt like a prison. She started to lose sleep, her nerves fraying as the days went by. The servants noticed the change in her, but they said nothing. They knew better than to speak out of turn. Yuchena, on the other hand, was oblivious to Amoka's growing fear. He was too busy with his business and enjoying his newfound freedom from Chidema. He spent his days in meetings and his nights at lavish parties, confident that his life was finally back on track. But Yuchena's arrogance blinded him to the reality of the situation. He did not see how the mansion had changed, how the air had grown heavy with an unseen presence. He did not hear the whispers that tormented Amoka, nor did he feel the cold that seeped into the walls. One night, as Yuchena lay in bed, he was awakened by a soft rustling sound. At first, he thought it was the wind, but as he listened more closely, he realized it was coming from inside the room. He sat up, his heart pounding, and looked around. There, in the corner of the room, stood a figure, a woman, her face obscured by shadows. Yuchena blinked, convinced that he was dreaming, but when he opened his eyes, the figure was still there. Who are you? Yuchena demanded, his voice trembling. But the figure did not respond. Instead, it began to move towards him, slowly, deliberately. As the figure drew closer, Yuchena's fear turned to terror. He tried to get out of bed, but his body would not obey him. It was as though he was frozen in place, unable to move or even scream. The figure stopped at the foot of the bed, and for the first time, Yuchena could see its face. It was Chidema. But her eyes were empty, her skin pale and cold. She looked like a ghost, a shell of the woman he had once known. Why, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Why did you abandon me? Why did you take my child away? Yuchena's mouth moved, but no sound came out. He could only stare in horror as Chidima's ghostly figure reached out towards him. Her fingers were like ice as they brushed against his skin, sending a chill through his entire body. You will pay for what you've done, Chidima whispered, her voice now filled with anger. You will pay for your arrogance, for your cruelty. With that, she disappeared, leaving Yuchena gasping for breath. He lay there, drenched in sweat, his mind reeling from what he had just experienced. It had to be a nightmare, he told himself. There was no other explanation. But the next morning, when Yuchena awoke, he found a bruise on his arm where Chidima's ghost had touched him. The mark was dark and ugly, a reminder of the previous night's terror. Yuchena tried to brush it off as a coincidence, but deep down, he knew better. Amoka, too, was suffering. The whispers had become screams, echoing through her mind even during the day. She could no longer bear to be in the mansion, but she was too afraid to leave. She knew that if she left, Yuchena would never take her back, and she would lose everything. The final straw came when Amoka found herself standing in front of the baby's crib one night, a pillow in her hands. She had no memory of getting out of bed or picking up the pillow, but there she was, poised to smother the child. Horrified, she dropped the pillow and ran from the room. She knew then that she had to leave. Whatever was haunting the mansion was driving her to madness, and if she stayed, she feared she would lose control completely. The next morning, Amoka packed her bags and left without a word to Yuchena. When Yuchena returned home that evening and found Amoka gone, he was furious. He called her repeatedly, but she did not answer. He sent his driver to her apartment, but she was not there. It was as though she had vanished without a trace. Yuchena's anger quickly turned to fear. He was not used to things slipping out of his control, and this sudden turn of events unsettled him deeply. But there was no time to dwell on it, his business demanded his attention, and so he pushed the strange occurrences to the back of his mind. Days passed, and Yuchena tried to focus on his work, but the mansion had changed. 
it felt colder, darker, as though a shadow had fallen over it. The servants went about their duties in silence, avoiding Uchenna's eyes, whispering among themselves about the strange things they had seen and heard. One evening, as Uchenna sat alone in his study, the lights began to flicker. He ignored it at first, but then they went out completely, plunging the room into darkness. Uchenna reached for his phone to call for help, but before he could dial, he heard it, the sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, coming from the hallway. His heart pounded in his chest as the footsteps grew louder, closer. The door to the study creaked open, and Uchenna held his breath, unable to move. In the faint light from the hallway, he saw a figure standing in the doorway, a woman, her face hidden in shadow. Who's there? Uchenna's voice was shaky, barely a whisper. The figure didn't respond. It simply stood there, watching him, the air around it growing colder and colder until Uchenna could see his breath in the air. Then, without warning, the lights flickered back on, and the figure was gone. Uchenna jumped from his chair, his heart racing. He ran to the door and looked out into the hallway, but it was empty. No one was there. His mind was racing. Had he really seen something, or was his mind playing tricks on him? The fear that had been gnawing at the edges of his consciousness was now consuming him entirely. For the first time, Uchenna felt a deep sense of regret for what he had done to Chedima, but it was a regret born more out of fear for his own safety than out of any true remorse. In a desperate attempt to regain control, Uchenna decided to visit his spiritual advisor, a powerful man known for his ability to ward off evil spirits. The advisor listened quietly as Uchenna recounted the strange happenings at the mansion, his voice trembling with fear. You have angered the spirits, the advisor said solemnly. You cast away your wife, the mother of your child, and now the spirits of the ancestors are displeased. They do not tolerate such disrespect towards a woman who has given life. Uchenna felt a chill run down his spine. He had always believed in the power of the ancestors, but he had never imagined they could turn against him in such a way. What do I do? he asked, his voice barely above a whisper. You must make amends, the advisor replied. You must bring your wife back, apologize to her, and treat her with the respect she deserves. Only then will the spirits be appeased. Uchenna hesitated. His pride had always been his greatest flaw, and the thought of humbling himself before Chidima was unbearable. But the fear that had taken root in his heart was stronger than his pride, and so he nodded, agreeing to the advisor's terms. The next morning, Uchenna set out for the village where Chidima was staying with her parents. The journey felt long, his thoughts heavy with the weight of what he had to do. When he arrived, Chidima's parents were surprised to see him, but they did not welcome him warmly. They had heard of how he had treated their daughter, and they were not eager to forgive. Chidima came out to see him, her face pale but composed. She looked at Uchenna with a mixture of sadness and anger, the pain he had caused her still fresh in her eyes. Uchenna felt a pang of guilt, but he swallowed it down, determined to follow through with his plan. Chidinma, he began, his voice low and uncertain. I... I was wrong. I should never have treated you the way I did. I was a fool. Please, come back with me. Let's raise our son together. Chidinma looked at him, her eyes narrowing. You think an apology can erase what you did? You think saying sorry will make everything right? Uchenna was taken aback by the coldness in her voice. He had expected her to be grateful, to accept his apology without question. But he realized now how much he had hurt her, how deep the wounds he had inflicted truly were. I know I can't change the past, Uchenna said, his voice cracking. But I want to make things right. Please, give me a chance. Chidinma shook her head. You cast me aside when I needed you the most. You took my child from me and gave him to another woman. And now you want to make things right. Uchenna, you cannot undo the damage you've done. 
Yuchenna fell to his knees, tears streaming down his face. The weight of his actions pressed down on him, crushing his pride, his arrogance. Please, Chidinma, he begged. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. For a long moment, Chidima said nothing. She looked down at Yuchena, her heart torn between the pain he had caused her and the love she had once felt for him. Finally, she spoke, her voice soft but firm. I cannot go back to that house, she said. Not after everything that's happened. But for the sake of our son, I will forgive you. I will not return to the mansion, but you may bring him here to see me, and we will raise him together, but separately. Yuchena nodded, his heart heavy with regret. It was not the outcome he had hoped for, but it was more than he deserved. He thanked Chidima and her parents, and left the village, knowing that the life he had once known was gone forever. When Yuchena returned to the mansion, it felt even colder and emptier than before. The ghostly presence that had haunted him was gone, but so too was the warmth, the life that had once filled the house. He had his son back, but at a great cost. From that day on, Yuchena lived a quiet, solitary life. His businesses continued to thrive, but the joy he once took in his wealth and power was gone. The mansion, once a symbol of his success, now felt like a tomb, a reminder of the family he had lost through his own pride and arrogance. He visited Chidima and his son regularly, bringing gifts and trying to be the father he had once thought he could never be. But the bond between them was strained, the wounds too deep to fully heal. Chidima remained distant, polite but guarded, her heart no longer open to him. In the end, Yuchena had learned a painful lesson. His wealth and power had blinded him to the things that truly mattered, love, family, and respect. And though he had tried to make amends, he could never fully undo the damage he had caused. He lived out his days in the mansion, surrounded by his riches, but haunted by the emptiness of his own making. The people of Enugu continued to speak of Uchenna, but not with the same admiration they once had. His story became a cautionary tale, a reminder of the dangers of pride and arrogance, and the importance of valuing those who truly matter. And so, Yuchena's name lived on, not as a symbol of wealth and power, but as a lesson in the consequences of forgetting what is truly important in life.